Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome to Conversations, and welcome to Harvey Mansfield. Joining us once again. Uh, thank you for taking My the pleasure, time to do this. My pleasure, as always. Oh, that's nice of you. And I thought we would discuss higher education, which you've been right. involved in for your entire life, and yeah. professor of government at Harvard since 1962. And, uh -huh. and so how, how that we can talk about free speech, talk about liberal education, more, more generally, how fares how fares higher education these days? Yeah, we can do all of those things. Uh, Good. Perhaps a, a best lead-in would be uh, an, an example of of higher education. <laughs> uh, recently, when I was disinvited from uh, Concordia University uh, in Montreal, Concordia has a small liberal arts college within it that's devoted to great books, and I was invited to give their commencement address, and then. Uh, later on, disinvited. So um, uh, I wrote an article about this in the Wall Street Journal. Um, one remarkable thing was the letter. Uh, I, I got, first I had a letter from a principal, as he's called, Mark Russell, and, <coughs> to invite me. And then I had a, another letter, a second letter from him, to disinvite me. So this was a kind of sort of problem that he had. And uh, he solved it in a way which I think is a is, is an example of the science of public administration. Yeah. Yeah. How, here you invite someone and then you write a second letter to disinvite you. How do you handle this? It's sort of a hot potato. Yeah. And, and according to the best science, uh, what you should do is to be able to pass off this hot potato to somebody else with the least loss of heat transfer to yourself. Yeah. And that's what he did. So he didn't accuse me of um, revealing, of, of being revealed as a rascal um, who has uh, inappropriate views, but he also didn't admit that uh, he was, uh, or apologize for what he was doing, which was a, a kind of uh, insult. Well, uh, to come to the substance of the matter. But what had happened? Why were you disinvited? What happened was that uh, uh, women, cer certain feminist women, in the faculty uh, with the inst at the instance of, uh, of alumni, or perhaps just with the support of alumni, um, de decided that uh, I didn't deserve to speak there. And uh, so, um, so I should be disinvited. And this was uh, an act of justice and you know, nothing uh, remarkable about it, and so Principal Russell said, sorry for the inconvenience <laughs> in this letter to me. That's all he said he was sorry for. Uh, and, uh, well, it, no, it wasn't just an inconvenience, it was an insult, um, as I said. But um, so there the, are the, 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 the two things, I think, that, and I talked about them both, uh, that could be two issues that could be raised from uh, what was done. And first, uh, some of the nature of feminism, in um, higher education today, and also uh, the question of free speech. And it turns out that those two may be related. So first on um, the nature of feminism, um, today's feminism is uh, 20th century feminism dating from Simone de Beauvoir, uh, and it differs from uh, um, 19th century feminism, the feminism of the suffragettes, both of those movements wanted equality, equality for women. But the first one, the suffragettes, stressed the particular virtues of women, admitting their, how to say, relative physical weakness, perhaps, uh, to men, but stressing the virtues of whom women are more moral. If you give them the vote, they will improve our politics by purifying it and from these drunkard husbands right. and males uh, who, uh, who are uh, uh, corrupting our country. So, and that, so that, their, their equality was really a kind of uh, 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 all-around equality. That is, uh, women were superior in some respects and not and inferior in others, and taken together, uh, they and men were, generally speaking, equal. But no, in the 20th century, uh, Simone de Beauvoir argued that, uh, that the two sexes are identical almost. 
almost identical, she couldn't quite go the, the whole way, um, and that uh, equality can only be achieved by <coughs> um, being similar or the same as uh, the other sex, uh, the male sex. So that meant that uh, women were uh, uh, claiming not to be better than men, but uh, to be more deserving because they've been uh, underrepresented in important or um, occupations, ones that receive recognition, women now would have the same equal recognition as men. They'd always been uh, received less, just your, your mother, your wife, very fine, but um, it doesn't give you a, a door in an office with your name on it. <laughs> so. Uh, now, so there would be this all-around equality, and this was, uh, um, but it turns out that when women go to work, they are more vulnerable than men, so they're subject to sexual harassment, and all kinds of measures have to be taken about sexual harassment, which were not necessary when men dominated uh, the workplace. Uh, now their men's domination had to be <laughs> much more carefully mentored, um, uh, yeah, uh, watched over, and measures taken against it. So, and this exposed the kind of the uh, the contradiction in in present-day feminism between the equality of women, which would mean that women are equally strong as men, and the vulnerability of women. They're not equally strong as men, but they're subject to being pushed around, um, induced uh, to misbehave, and generally put upon. This is, uh, by the way, not an accusation which is, uh, has nothing to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, uh, the life of a woman is, in, in some ways, being constantly, at least under the threat of being put upon, pushed around, by men who do this uh, oblivious to what they're doing for the most part or, or nastily uh, aware of it. Right. So you can have either experience, and that is part of being a woman to live that way. So one, one has to uh, understand this, I think, as, as part of the picture. But still it is, a, it's a, it is a contradiction. And it's true they found things that I'd said. Uh, I made some remark about disparaging remark about the capacity of women in science. Look around at the top scientists, that kind of thing. Are they women? Um, maybe, maybe they are beginning to be, we'll see. Um, but still, uh, so that was on the record. And this was, therefore, this is something uh, that women needed to be kept safe from. So, um, so you weren't invited to speak about no, I wasn't. In, I wasn't no, wasn't I wasn't going topic. to talk about uh, right how lowly women are. <laughs> yeah, was, uh, no, that wasn't the subject. It was, I was supposed to talk about great books, um, and of course, great books contain many subversive notions. Right. You know, many different, diverse, opposing, contradictory uh, views on, on various things. So there's nothing more diverse than a great book's education. I'm just throwing that in. Well, that's a good yeah. point, though. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, um, so so the so there's a desire among uh, the feminist women that for women to have a, a, a safe space where they're not made uncomfortable, life is not disagreeable to them, by having to face or confront uh, contradictory views, and this was, had been very much the method of, of uh, the s success of, of 20th century feminism. It succeeded by what it called raising consciousness. And the way to raise consciousness was to make men aware of the way in which they mistreat women. And one of the ways to do it, uh, that it's been done, is through pronouns. Right. So you talk about a doctor and then you sort of unconsciously say he as if it's a necessary thing that a doctor has to be a male. This is, this is the way the, uh, the feminists talk. So we must correct the use of pronouns, and that was done through 
you know, through sort of lowly women copy editors and university presses. So it's part of the history of, of the success of, of feminism uh, in the second half of the, of the 20th century. And it was a success. You know, you really have changed the, the, the face of uh, American culture. Um, so um, raising consciousness. And, um, but uh, this, this meant that they didn't really, really argue in the way that the 19th century suffragettes did. They didn't want why it is that women are equal, but that was just assumed to be the case. And who are you to stand up against this right. obvious uh, uh, injustice and, and, and pay no attention to it? So that's terrible. Now, so now this um, also was accompanied by um, a view of, of free speech. And um, so let me back up and talk a little bit about free speech. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's important because you could be feminist and you could have an institution that embodies even modern feminist principles and laws and, and procedures, but you could still have, you speak there, right? You weren't coming to change the That's right. promotion policies or sexual harassment policies or, yeah. or right. laws and procedures of universities in Canada, right? Yeah. So you, you, you would have had no effect, right. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say, on any of those things. Yeah. So it is kind of astounding that the next step was, it seems to me, yeah. that the next step of not wanting you to be there was taken. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, why did they do that? Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, they did that because of a misunderstanding or a new understanding, let's be neutral, uh, of, of free speech. Uh, to understand free speech, you have to first understand speech. Now, I wrote a small article on this uh, in, in National Affairs a couple of years ago on the value of free speech. I mean, when uh, speech is different from the voice of an animal, which is a grunt of pleasure or a scream of fright or growl of anger, all these um, um, uh, can be voiced, but it doesn't become speech until you give a reason for it. And it does seem to be a peculiarity of the human being that you can't get angry at something, especially some slight for example, the, the, the slights that women have faced uh, without giving a reason. And when you give a reason, you go beyond expressing your private reaction to this slight. Uh, and, you, and, and you give a reason which would apply not just to you, but to anyone like you, to someone like you. So that's, in other words, you generalize. Right. Speech is generalizing. It isn't just expressing your own private urge, but it's giving a reason why, some, you, why your audience should be interested and aware and perhaps uh, react as you did. So speech is always directed at an audience. It isn't uh, just for your own that private uh, psychological health or to, I, I got to get this off my chest. Right. Well, we do talk that way. And there is a lot of speech, or so-called speech, <clears throat> which is a kind of uh, expression and, uh, and, and reactive and doesn't have much reason to it. But that, I would say, is an imitation of what is really speech. Right. What is really speech is, is an argument um, that uh, speech is, is always potentially a dialogue. There's somebody there you're addressing and you're trying to get that person to agree with you. Maybe he or she won't, but uh, uh, she'll, she'll uh, kind of answer with her own point of view. Right. And, that, and that also is an argument and that's directed back to you. And especially when you argue, you're trying to find a reason which would convince the person that you're addressing. So not just simple defiance. Um, so uh, wh what's happened is uh, that free speech has come to be understood as free expression. Then this is partly the fault of the Supreme Court, which 
in a line of cases has uh, said that very same thing. So that often today, uh, uh, people speak of free expression, and then free speech is a kind of subset of free expression. Or is it ought to be the other way around? You should speak of free speech, and then free expression is a, is a subsidiary and not a very respectable one of, um, of free speech. Um, and there are enemies, therefore, to free speech. Speech is sometimes used against reason, against argument. So this, the one, uh, one I mean, one is the uh, typical political uh, tactic of, of uh, ca characterization, personal characterization, or attacking, attacking the character of your, of your right. opponent, or so. Uh, what Clinton called the politics of personal destruction, mm -hmm. which was directed against him, the, the politics of personal destruction. So that, that is a kind of, I think, um, truly um, a distortion of, of, of speech and hence of uh, free speech. And then, but then also there's the view, even the philosophic view, that there isn't any such thing as speech. Uh, in this, in the sense I've been describing, um, all speech is an expression of power, and um, if you have a lot of power, then uh, you you express it <laughs> through your uh, through your speech. You push people around by speaking harshly and dogmatically to them, and this has been very much the uh, uh, doctrine of Catherine McKinnon, a prominent. Um, law school feminist, I think it's had a, a lot of uh, effect on the thinking of universities. And she, she's said this about free speech, uh, but she's also compared, uh, she's one, one who speaks of safe spaces for women, and she uses the word violation, that you can violate a woman's a uh, safe space by saying something disagreeable to her uh, in, a, in a way that, that makes one think that uh, this, a speech that a woman doesn't like to hear is a kind of, a kind of rape or maybe incipient rape. Right. Um, so, so all speech is uh, trickery or um, either forceful speech or uh, fraudulent speech. And uh, nobody really ever makes um, a real argument because a real argument isn't a possible thing. It isn't possible to generalize. It's you're, you always have something of yourself in what you say. And so that's, uh, that's really a difficult and, and, and terrific uh, question to take up. But see, now, now you see how, but you begin to see how the, um, the feminism is connected to the attack on, on free speech. That um, it isn't only from feminism that, um, um, that, that free speech is endangered, but uh, it's endangered by something which, is, which covers or includes feminism. And that is that every speech has a point of view. Every speech is a, a self-expression or a point of view, and this is, I think, the argument of postmodernism. So feminism is, uh, is an interesting, and perhaps even the crucial uh, example of postmodernism. Um, just, um, feminism is above all directed against um, feminine modesty. It, is, it isn't so much directed against men as it is against women although other women, the women who believe in the feminine mystique, right. that is, uh, that it was the, that's the title of Betty Friedan's famous book. Uh, the feminine mystique is that women are better than men, that they that are, live on a platform, and are, you know, right. we're all devoted, we're, we, we gallant males right. um, uh, look up to women, they are my better half, right. that kind of talk. So, and which is a form of trickery. We're trying, we're really trying to control them by praising them. So, so this, uh, so, 
But it's funny that uh, the notion of safe space is a kind of resurrection or continuation of the idea of, uh, of feminine modesty. Because in, in other words, modesty comes out <laughs> in the form of, of uh, defiant uh, <laughs> reluctance to hear anything that, that, uh, that you don't like. Um, and also you could say male gallantry too reappears in the, in the male feminist which is a, a funny character of our time, the, the male who uh, takes the part of, uh, of feminist women and um, wants universities to be flooded with women so that, um, so that they can at last receive their just due. These are all Sir Lancelot types uh, dressed uh, in, uh, in modern, in, uh, yeah, in, in modern, attire, <laughs> jeans and t-shirts. Right. So, um, no, but this is all, a, a, you know, I think I, a, a very important issue for the university. Uh, and I, I think uh, we could look at uh, what's going on in the universities in, in general today as a, um, as a reenactment of, uh, or as an enactment of, of uh, this feminist uh, um, objection. And you saw this uh, in the famous case of Nancy Hopkins and Larry Summers, Harvard president, Nancy Hopkins, uh, MIT scientist, uh, at a meeting when Larry Summers made the remark that, uh, you know, but there might be something in the nature of women that makes them less uh, less capable as in science, and perhaps we should investigate that scientific point of view. Um, well, seen through immediately by Nancy Hopkins, said that's just utterly disgusting, and and uh, may, made her want to throw up, right. and she left the meeting because this was a very disagreeable thing for him, for her to hear, and I think. Um, that's uh, um, that, that's really a very important issue. There's something to be said for um, Nancy Hopkins, and I'll say it. <laughs> and that is that uh, science, uh, um, the investigation, the continuing progress of science towards God knows what, what it will discover, is is a little frightening for us human beings. And it puts pressure on us, and it uh, at attacks our interests, seems to be altogether unaware of, oblivious to, uninterested in what's good for human beings. And then and she, and it was, it, was, it was a wonderful paradox that she, a woman scientist, <laughs> was a woman rebelling against science. That's essentially the meaning of what she did. And, so th this, I think, is a general picture of what is today going on in the universities, and the scientists uh, and the humanists. The thing is that the humanists aren't as uh, courageous as Nancy Hopkins. <laughs> right. They're totally confused. They have no way of, of defending themselves. They know that they're not science, and yet uh, um, they don't know what that is, to be what it is, what there is, is there an is in non-science? Or is it, uh, therefore, if it's non-science, it's just second rate, it's not real knowledge. So, there, and therefore, uh, deserves to, an inferior place in the present day university. But uh, let's come back to that in a minute because that's humanities and science gets to the questions of liberal education that you've written about and spoken about. But. Just on the, on the universities or the academy for a minute, I guess I am struck at the apparent <clears throat> I mean, failure to simply defend free speech as a principle in its own right. It may not be fully, they may not fully understand the grounds of it as you've, as you've laid them out. It might be a more traditionally liberal, mm -hmm. kind of just everyone should have the right to free speech and, yeah. or free expression even. But I am, and you might, you can see that in a political, in a society and politics, there'll be pressure on that because the majority or the 
or powerful groups might have an interest in suppressing it, but I guess it is striking to me that the Academy doesn't even hold to that kind of simple principle that we can't start yeah. going down the road of suppressing speech. I mean, why is free speech? Yeah. I thought they were supposed to be such dogmatic sort of libertarians on that issue in the academy, isn't that, you know, uh, you know tenure and academic freedom yeah. and all that, I mean. And well, it turns out that supporting free speech is more difficult than, than just accepting a principle. And it, you know, be, because of uh, free, free speech really only thrives when there's contested speech and speech that people disagree with. So if everybody has one opinion, then yeah, you have to be very courageous or an idiosyncratic, or just a provocateur, provo right. uh, provocateur, right. or, 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 or an, a kind of idiot uh, to stand up against it. So free speech doesn't have respectable adherence. So now, uh, so in, in our country, it, it, it does have, we have two parties, everybody knows that. Right. And the two parties are very much disagree and they argue with each other. So that they provides a kind of basis for... Yeah, so uh, that's, a better, that's a stronger basis for free speech than in the universities when everybody says the same, are all liberals, uh, effectually, and everybody says the same thing. So they're unable to distinguish between speech and expression. And if someone wants to use expression with a protest that... Uh, uh, stop somebody else from speaking, it looks as if that has the same right of free speech. <laughs> so free speech sort of uh, works against itself in that way, or doesn't, doesn't know how to defend itself. But, but on sort of John Stuart Mill type grounds, one could still distinguish free expression, let's just call it, yeah. at, that's, that doesn't deny other people their freedom of expression and free expression that does, and that's kind of the standard, I would say, intelligent liberal defense of free speech these days in universities, the University of Chicago statement or whatever, it's kind yeah. of, and so they- Well, that's, that's it, very good, and that, I mean, but they, that's, that's You're good. saying they can't really, it's hard to hold that line without a kind of basic, you know, yeah. just as a doctrinal matter, so it, right, Mill, right. Mill doesn't work without a kind of a- yeah. Something behind Mill right. to explain, uh, to justify free speech or to explain what it is. And, uh, and that, that, it, that it is, it isn't just a matter of listening to your, <laughs> to your views being disagreed with. Well, it's, it's more a matter of argument. Do you take the other side seriously? And, and, um, and you see this all the time in politics. Now, there's nothing politicians don't do every day but argue with the other party. And they spend all their time thinking up. Some of them are, yes, tactical arguments. A lot right. of them are, maybe all of them are. Right. But still behind it, underneath it, is the notion that, um, that, 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 that speech is about argument and dialogue. So actual political uh, politics and political contestation is, in a funny way, provides more of a basis for defending free speech or makes it easier uh, practically to defend free speech than the ivory tower where there aren't these parties and where one would think though at first blush it might be easier, I mean, just accept the principle of free speech. Well, why is that so hard? But I guess it's... Yeah, it, it is. It is harder than you it's think. Ha it's harder than you think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because, uh, um, because of the importance of the point of view. I mean, I suppose if one believed that it would contribute to progress, maybe yeah. this is to get back to the sciences, yeah. there's not much, there's a little bit of suppression, I suppose, of dissonant views in science too, if they might lead to politically uncomfortable solutions. Mm -hmm. But at some point, especially in the non-human sciences, yeah. I don't know that people are interested in suppressing no. different physics you know, theories no. because no. you need to find out it's, which one it, is correct and more correct. Exactly right, yeah. So there's no basis for anybody's self-interest finding expression. In fact, science is not about proper names. <laughs> right. It's about uh, common nouns, to uh. say. Or, or, yeah. And so uh, I, I like to remark the, the buildings at MIT have numbers, not names. Right. Because <laughs> they, they get away from the idea of human importance. Human importance is self-importance. It's making... 
uh, trying to bend the world to your will. And, uh, and no, science is based on facts. So it just keeps on discovering new facts. And that makes a bit of a problem. Uh, for example, in a, in a university science course, say you're having a liberal arts university, you want to teach uh, science to non-scientists. Uh, this is part of a liberal education that the two sides get to know each other. Um, what kind of course do you, do you teach a, a, a course in present day science, which means uh, that uh, it, it'll be obsolete in a, in, a, in a short while? Or do you try to discover the essence of science and uh, what, how, what best characterizes science? So at Harvard, yeah, yeah, where I was in 1949 as a freshman, <laughs> I came and they were just getting started with general education. And general education was a great program that was instituted by the president, then President Conan, and described and promoted in a, um, the, uh, in, a, in a book called General Education in a Free Society that came out in 1945 and made quite a splash, I think, in American higher education at the time. And if you reread it, as I did uh, a while ago, um, you cannot help but be impressed with the level of argumentation, because it, it does it mainly deals with, the, uh, with what I think is the, is the main issue in universities today, the relationship between science and, and humanities. And said so Conant had been, uh, he was Harvard president, but he'd been the uh, head of the Manhattan program that had made, uh, discovered the atomic bomb and, uh, yeah, during World War II. Um, and he, he appreciated the um, argument that took place among scientists. It was, again, this Nancy Hopkins argument, whether, whether science should be let to run its course and we should discover everything that we can discover, or whether it should be controlled and guided by some principle. Well, uh, and then there were two principles that, that might have, two competing principles. One was our national interest, win the war, and the other was uh, sort of the human interest of humanity uh, in not producing um, a weapon of, as we now say, mass destruction right. that could, uh, could uh, eventually or quickly kill off all of humanity. Right. Uh, so out of that argument, uh, Kona decided that uh, Harvard needed to be devoted uh, in, in good part to this, to the, connection between scientists and non-scientists. And that was why he wanted this program of general education, which would be liberal education. And, uh, and I, th I think that was an that was estimable point. Required for yeah, so when I was uh, coming back to me as a freshman in 1949, I took a course which was taught by Conant called Natural Sciences for, and which was a kind of history of science course, which, uh, uh, considered uh, different uh, eras of science, like the Newtonian era, the Ptolemaic era, and so on. Um, and and, and um, in, in order to get the essence of science, rather than to just learn what physics was presently saying right. about the facts of uh, that it that it uncovers. Um, and the funny thing is that among the teachers in that course was a man named Thomas Kuhn, uh, who later on in 1962 published a famous book called The Structure of Scientific Revolution, in which he gave a kind of political or politicized version of science. He says science is characterized by normal science. The normal science is the science of the present paradigm. And there's, so scientists don't individually search out facts for themselves, but they always think in terms of some paradigm, like the Coper Copernican mm -hmm. um, paradigm, say, or the Newtonian paradigm. And everybody agrees with that until at a certain point uh, uh, someone comes up with a new paradigm. So the only way to science progresses is, by, is through this new point of view. 
So you see how that's connected to um, postmodernism. Right. So science is a form of reason, which is a form of logic, and that is subordinate to politics, the power, the power that human beings have to control their lives or to, and other people's lives through uh, the way that we think. And so that was, uh, that was, I think, uh, uh, quite, uh, quite a remarkable discovery. Or, but now, of course, Thomas Kuhn was not the inventor of this point of view. Point right. of view. You could say postmodernism is the, is the point of view of the point of view. So, yeah, is um, the point of view means that there isn't any truth. Right. Every, everything is a point of view. And you can f first find this, or best find this actually, still best find it in uh, the philosophy of Nietzsche. Friedrich Nietzsche wrote, especially in, say, the first part, the first um, um, chapter of Beyond Good and Evil, where Nietzsche talks about the perspectivic. Every view of anything has a perspective. Mm -hmm. Anytime you look at the world, there's always a horizon. A horizon is a limitation, a limitation which Nietzsche says is arbitrary, but which is necessary for you to control things. Otherwise, everything would be chaotic. chaotic yeah. So there has to be a kind of limitation. And this limitation is you, it comes from you, that's your self-expression, and makes you think the way that you do. And so this is, uh, the, um, this is, I think, which, which is beyond postmodernism. Postmodernism, the point of view, and then everybody has a point of view. Now, what, is, what I just said, is that true, or is that just another point of view? Or is that kind of difficult? No. So it seems that even the postmodernism needs truth, right. at least from that kind of elementary point of refutation, you might say. But so every, everything has a point of view, and I think that infects our, our notion of free speech. And it also infects many other things or characteristics of the modern university. One is identity. Then that identity is, is a point of view which is an attempt to uh, impose yourself on others. So it's directed at others, but it doesn't argue with them but it treats um, the university and its, and, and, as, as an arena of uh, power struggle. Uh, it's either a battleground, it's, it's still being fought out, or it's a, a, a zone of triumph. The one side has won and declares uh, its identity. And suddenly we've got the same problem of points of view. Uh, you could say diversity, diversity is having different identities. Right. Well, there's an, then is that one thing, the one true thing to have diversity? Or is the whole idea of diversity just another identity? And then, you know, so you can go on to that. And another, and another consequence uh, that, that goes together with uh, identity is choice. So at Harvard, I think it's the same at other universities to uh, uh, students' choice is the most thing you most want to preserve and promote. So, um, so the, the number of requirements is, is reduced to a bare minimum and um, nothing is to be imposed. If something bad happens, what do you do? You take a survey. Uh, in order to find out what the students choose. Right. Uh, so, so there isn't anything true that you can appeal to. So hence choice, democratic choice. Um, tr and, and choice is a kind of funny thing too. Say, once you choose something, then you're sort of committed to it. Like you choose to get married to a certain person. <laughs> then you can't go back on that. Or you can, you can get divorced, but then that doesn't leave, put you back where you right. were before you chose. 
So choosing consists in sort of limiting yourself with choices over sort of, so you, you, all of which are arbitrary, could have gone the other way. Um, so you end up with a life that you chose, <laughs> and yet it feels totally uh, imposed on you. And then nothing, nothing intrinsically satisfying. So, and, this, and this choice is also connected to the doctrine of self-esteem. And then if you choose uh, yeah, <laughs> the, the thing you uh, esteem the most is the chooser, uh, the, the faculty of choosing, which you would try to exercise. You, it's what def defines you, and yet you must exercise it as little as possible because <laughs> of this difficulty of once you choose something, you, know, you lose your options. So you wa I want to maintain my options, so I don't choose. And I, <laughs> I, 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 I sit there in, um, in, in uh, uninformed uh, um, disinterest and, and ignorance. So, so, and, and, and what is connected to uh, self-esteem? Affirmative action, one, and two, uh, great inflation. And affirmative action, then we must uh, raise the self-esteem of the identities that we want to promote. So we give them preferences, give them a break. Uh, they're included. You have to be on, on the official list of those to be included in order to be included. Right. If you're not on that list, then you're excluded right. because every inclusion is an exclusion of someone else. Those people can get resentful. Be careful. Watch out. Um, so they might vote for Trump. Right. Yeah. Things like that can well, launch can lawsuits happen. if they're yeah. Asian. Uh, yeah. And then great inflation. That's another one, which is um, no student should uh, face a disgrace uh, or self-abasement of of a, of a C. So the C has totally disappeared from American college life. I think that's uh, a, a bit of an exaggeration, but. Uh, one of those exaggerations that really that is really true. Right. You know, the, the whole sense of average has been lost in our society, even though it's a fact that uh, almost entirely one half of Americans are below average in right. intelligence. Right. Yeah. Which people sort of know, and they make jokes about it, but then they yeah. don't want to really <laughs> they don't re <laughs> think right. too hard about it. Yeah, they're not going to do anything about it. But why is, I mean, so you say, I think, in the essay you wrote on the Harvard General Education Curriculum that relativism becomes debilitating in the sense that everything is just a kind of slightly random, arbitrary choice and it, it, nothing is taken seriously. But one could, of course, a certain kind of relativism or, <coughs> excuse me, a certain kind of relativism or Nietzschean perspectivism or whatever could encourage a real confrontation of different Yes. ways of life and ways of right. thought. And as you say, the great books are very diverse. So in a way, it's healthy, you would argue, one could argue, to have this, yeah. uh, this kind it of is, debate put, as opposed to yeah. a kind of simple-minded yeah. progressivism, let's say, yeah. where Plato's overtaken by right. you know, uh, Locke, who's overtaken by Hume, who's, you know, it's right. more interesting to actually have them confront each other. So yeah. but why does it go in this debilitating, if it does, in this debilitating direction instead of a... Yes, you would think it could, yeah. Yeah. I think that's, uh, there is this word I've recently come across called intersectionality. I mean, so what's the problem? I guess I'll put it, is the problem with higher education today, the, the lack of, is it the conformity or is it the diversity? I mean, or somehow it's both at once? I mean, or, yeah. it, it, or somehow those are two uh, identical things. Isn't that, that's a little crazy. <laughs> it and is. It think, is crazy, uh, yeah. Yeah. So I think the diversity is less real than the conformity somehow in a exactly. Tocquevillian way, right? That yeah. Right. So the, yeah, the, um, the diversity isn't real diversity because it, um, it's, it just lo looks for people with the same opinion who uh, have a different sex or color. So that, that's, right. uh, that, that's all it is. So it, it, um, the diversity is in, uh, you might say, uh, less less important matters and the conformity in, in what really what is really really carries import and that's uh, opinion 
people guide their lives with opinions. Opinions are uh, well or ill-formed reasons. <laughs> so we're back to back uh, to reason, back yeah. to reason and speech. And do you think so? You came to Harvard, it's hard to believe, seventy years ago, and been <laughs> teaching there yeah. fifty-five plus years, um, as we speak in what May twenty nineteen. Um, I mean, is it worse? Has it gotten worse? Is it better? Is it just a constant problem of democracy? Is it a constant problem of modernity? Is it a constant problem of life? <laughs> it is a constant problem of uh, modernity <laughs> and, <laughs> and therefore of life. <laughs> yeah. Right, it is. Uh, but but I mean, it's gotten worse. Is that right? Notably, so uh, genuinely, you think? Genuinely in worse. In a, the, uh, the big change was in the late 60s when, when postmodernism, the attack on the university as such, uh, became respectable. And worse on the and free speech front and on the liberal education front? Because yeah, one can imagine them going in different directions. In fact, I think they did for a little while, maybe, you could argue, well, I would argue. I mean, you know, you could imagine a vigorous world of free expression that doesn't have much in the way yeah. of liberal education, yeah. but is a lot of opinions. Well, there were, uh, or you can imagine yeah, the opposite, yeah. a lot of uh, liberal uh, education uh, without much freedom of expression, I suppose. Yeah, or maybe absolutely. you can't, I don't know. That's yeah. <laughs> No. In the late 60s, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, uh, it, it wasn't that way. It was, uh, that, uh, it, in a way, it was, uh, you could say, um, a good s situation for free speech yeah. because there were conservatives. Right. It's, was it's, the yeah. movement called the free speech yeah. movement? It's not, I think, uh, yeah, uh, at Berkeley. Yeah, the new left was born in the, in the late 60s, but also uh, the conservative movement, really, as right. a... Uh, as a self-defined movement um, in in opposition, I remember you had something to do with that. No, uh, but I was just a kid. Uh, but yeah, as a student at Harvard it, at yeah. the time, I remember. So, um, uh, that yeah, was, one had uh, the sense uh, of more of a confrontation yeah. of ideas. And I, and on the one hand, it, w it was it was it uh, was wearing and, uh, right. and uh, it's wearing to be angry all the time. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, yeah, but on the other hand, uh, some uh, important issues were raised, and so. But what happened was the gradual replacement of, of the conservatives or the old liberals, the old liberals, the New, New Deal liberals, the uh, anti-communist Cold War liberals, people like my father, people like all of my uh, professors at Harvard at that time, uh, were gradually replaced by, uh, by feminists and, um, and progressives, uh, both of them uh, postmodern. And increasingly so, and, it, and also an increasing obliviousness to the problem. So my, I got a lot of quantitative scientific colleagues, and they're uh, also like just like the people at uh, MIT. So on the one hand, totally devoted to science, and on the other hand, totally devoted to feminism. Right. And, um, and Nancy Hopkins points out that <laughs> her case points out that. Those two were opposed. And, and do you think? I mean, this is my instinct, but maybe I'm wrong. That since in the real in the real world, one has to pick one's fights, I suppose, and in a way adopt some half true or two thirds true principle. And you can't fight everything at once. That it right. would be really important to fight the free speech fight first. I mean, or more fundamental. That's the greater danger somehow. That you, you know, even if you have to have a certain kind of relativistic approach to it and defense of it that, you know, let everyone speak, I think is an easier argument to make than a fancier, I don't know, liberal education argument at this point. I but, suppose that's true. Well, I, I suppose that you're saying yeah. that they're related and you can't really sustain mm. the free speech. Yeah, they are related, but, uh, but what you said is also true, <laughs> that you can't change everything at once and so you need to ad adopt um, a temporary or provisional I mean, I guess I'll give an instance, so I'm curious to know what your reaction to this is. I mean, since the article you wrote was in the context of the question of the core curriculum at Harvard and so forth, and um, I always thought I was in principle in favor of a core curriculum. I mean, I am, I suppose. I think some things are more worth studying than others, and 18, 19, 20-year-olds should be exposed to Shakespeare and the founding and so forth, and you can't just let everyone choose their courses because then you really could have mm -hmm. totally random kind of education or not real education for young people. Having said that, I was on the board of a public university in, in Virginia, Board of Visitors, and uh, 
there was actually a fight about whether they should have a core curriculum. They didn't have a core curriculum. They'd been a mm -hmm. more of a vocational technical school, and they were moving up in the world. And so the humanities people mostly there wanted to have a core curriculum. So there were an awful lot of students who were taking computer science or education or nursing to, to get their degrees and get jobs and weren't taking the courses in sociology or English or, or history or political science. And I remember as I was initially friendly to this, and as the debate went on, I became unfriendly to it because I thought, well, these people are taking real courses, hardworking, they're not getting a broad liberal education, they're not reading mm -hmm. Plato and so forth. But the, the, the substance of what was going to be in the core struck me as the worst of all worlds. Yes. It's sort of not helpful to them, and, and the, many of these people are spending right. hard-earned money to get a degree, yeah. which would help them in life. Yeah. It wouldn't be helpful, and it would just be kind of silly, yeah. liberal stuff or, or current academic yeah. fashions and so Not forth. really great books, but affirmative action books. Yeah. <laughs> so at that point, well, let's yeah. not have a core. Yeah. Let everyone teach what they want. Let everyone yeah. take what they want. And at least some of the students yeah. might find something good, and the other ones will get right. will get their professional right. accreditation right. And, and, and move on with life. So I don't know. It, it, in I practice, they'll, they'll try to subject Shakespeare to race, race class, and gender right. analysis. If they well, bother well, each may, other. Yeah. <laughs> if, but that's the thing, yeah. Uh, that's a good thing by, about such a course because they, the, the reading right. wor works against the teaching. Right, so that cuts the other way, that yeah. just getting Shakespeare in front of yeah. intelligent young people is a plus even if it's yes. taught in a stupid way. Right. So I guess that cuts, that cuts the other way, maybe yeah. in favor of so, acquiring some Shakespeare. I but yeah, right. I guess I'm practically um, more libertarian these days on educational uh -huh. matters than I would be in theory on the theory, just yes. because uh, that you think no, I, we need I, to preserve I, I think the freedom that's probably of right. yeah. professors to teach and students yeah. to study. And that, yeah, no, that well then maybe the crucial thing is more conservative professors, the hiring and, uh, and, and make it, uh, one should make the biggest objection, objection to lack of, um, of um, diversity of opinion in the universities. And maybe more diversity of, of uh, making sure at least the books get published and that we have conversations like this and students yeah. can learn outside the universities. I've really wondered a lot about that. Whether we do. We do much, need to. Yeah. How much one can count on the universities to educate as opposed to maybe one never really yeah. could that much, right? I mean, in a funny way. Most of human history, people haven't gotten most of their education. From universities. From universities. And yeah. A great medieval uh, invention. Right. And uh, let's and not. Hobbes complains about uh, them. And, I know. Uh, you know. <laughs> well, let's not spoil it. You, you, want, to, you want to preserve yeah. the universities, wanna, all things being yeah, equal. Yeah, you're right. Uh, it's good to have competitors to the university, right. but uh, yeah, I, I, it's where my heart is. And I suppose it's where, for the foreseeable future, most yeah. young men and women are going to go through and yeah. be somewhat shaped and somewhat educated. So, right. kind of important. Um, final thoughts, are you, so are you somewhat hopeful because at the end of the day, nature kind of, uh, uh, these great books yeah. reassert yes, themselves, themselves. Yes. And, or are you somewhat depressed? I, um, I, I'm the, somewhat hopeful. Okay, that's uh, good to I hear. just am that way. I think it's kind of duty, human duty to take the uh, happy view of things. Um, well, uh, not oblivious to the things that are that oppose our well-being, but um, yes, uh, because other, if we don't have it, if we make a mess of the complete mess of the universities, it's our fault. We didn't have to do it. Right. Yeah, that is remarkable, right? That it's yeah. it's not like the barbarian hordes destroying yeah. uh, all the books and libraries. It's right. a totally self-inflicted wound, right? Yeah. Okay, well, I've, you've left me somewhat cheered up, though not entirely cheered up, I'd like to say, but yeah, sort of a healthy, uh, what my father used to say that he was a cheerful pessimist. <laughs> You're more of a, uh, I don't know what, doubting optimist or something like that. Yeah. It's, it's a, yeah, skeptical optimist, maybe, but All right. good. But you've left us with uh, some hope, and look, on these, these works and that you've worked on all your life and translated some of which and written about and then your reflections on the university, all of those are there, right? That's the good news. Unless we literally enter book burning and, yeah. and true 
Orwellian, or, you know, yeah. suppression of everything that's been said right. and written. I think there's right. hope young people can find these, yeah. can get an education. Yes. Let's end with that. Yes. Okay. Harvey Mansfield, thank you for joining me today. Right. And thank you for joining us on Conversations.